Good morning, everyone. We still have some folks hopping on. We have a, as Deanna mentioned, we have a full house today, which we're glad to have folks here. This is something we've been doing for a couple of years, and I think we have several new folks with us. So I'm always thrilled. It's nice to see old friends and to meet new ones too. So glad to have you here. Um, you know, this used to be a live networking event and in the advent of COVID, everything became a webinar and it just seemed like a good idea. So I think we're gonna continue to do it, you know, regardless of what happens in the future. So we'll keep you all posted about other things that are coming. If you're interested and can join us, we'd love to have you. So today, this, you know, these are always a pleasure and I appreciate people who come and do these for us. And this is an in-house one today. Um, Ari is one of the people in the world that I have probably the most contact with outside of my wife and my kids, my family, <laughs> you know, there's Ari, uh, because Ari is our assistant director and uh, does a fabulous job <laughs> with all things that I'm not particularly good at. So I'm so appreciative. You're just a, a great person to work with. And this area of letter writing um, and working with trans youth and trans folks is just a big passion of yours. So I was thrilled when you said you would do this for us today. So thank you so much for being here, Ari. It looked like you had a little, uh, a slide that was going to describe a little bit more about you. So I'm going to let you do that. But thank you again for being here. Thank you all for being here. In terms of questions, when something comes up, if you have a question, again, we have a fairly full house. If I can get to all of them, I'll, if it's really pertinent, I'll stop Ari and ask something. If it's a clarifying question, I'll try to group them if several people are asking the same questions. And Ari, I think after each subject matter, you're going to stop and give people op an opportunity to ask some questions. So we'll make sure we get to all those. And then we'll have a whole 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. So all right, great. Thank you, Ari. We will let you take it from here. Thank you, Margo. Um, I'm super excited to be here. I know we have a lot of information to cover, so I'm just going to hop right in and, uh, and get started right away. So, oh, too fast. Okay. So, as Margo said, uh, I'm kind of assistant director at Juniper, which is half of what my time is. Um, I've been at Juniper for seven years. I currently have kind of a split role. So the other part, half of that assistant director is that I work as a clinician and really I'm just working solely around gender and sexuality. Uh, majority of my clients are trans or non-binary adolescents. That's just the, the majority of them, but I do work with um, all ages and other um, sexual identities. So for, I would say like the last decade, um, it's weird to say decade now in terms of my own um, time in the field, but I've basically been focusing my just practice. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> I've been focusing my practice around uh, queer identity issues. Um, and I just loved it. I really enjoyed doing that work. I don't consider myself an expert, and I'll, I'll use that a lot as, as you hear when we, as I continue the presentation, uh, because I don't feel like I know all and that I never will, right? I'm always gonna be trying to learn and gain knowledge. And today I kind of hope to be just one source of information in the sea that is out there. So I'm assuming most of the folks that we have that are joining us today practice in Illinois. There's certainly a potential for some folks to have dual licensure or practice in other states. So I just wanna point out that there might be some differences in legislation around insurance requirements if you're in another state. So just kind of be aware of that for the most part, especially right if it's a state that's around us in the Midwest, um, mostly gonna be the same. So, my last point before we really get kind of into it is before any presentation, I'm always gonna be highlighting privileges that I hold. And I think that's important because it impacts the perspective that I have. So I'm white, the majority of my clients are white. Um, I'm also cisgender, although I identify as queer and I'm gender nonconforming. I think it's important for me to state that and know that sort of that's my, that's my worldview and I'm gonna, do a lot to learn about other perspectives, but I, I can only come from what I know and, and my identities. Okay, next slide. Right. 
So ground rules and terms. All questions are welcome. I know that when I do presentations, folks are sometimes uncertain. Am I using the right language? Ooh, I don't want to like ask this question because I'm going to like sound like I don't know what I'm talking about. Please don't let that stop you. This is a learning space. That's why y'all are here. If there's any moments where language can maybe be changed, I'll use that as a teaching moment. So if a question comes across um, and we can phrase that a little differently, again, I'll use that because errors equals learning. Um, and I also invite y'all to do the same for me. So if there's a moment where I say something, I know a lot of times I try and keep my language very gender neutral. And sometimes as a 90s kid, I'll say you guys, and I'm like, oh, okay, I don't wanna say you guys when I'm talking to everyone. So if you need to correct me, please do so. I also wanna acknowledge that everyone here is coming to the table with a different knowledge. Uh, and I assume everyone's here to learn. So I just want to put that out there, make sure we expect respect each other's experiences. And then on the note of kind of people coming in with different knowledge, I might be using language that some folks are not familiar with. So I'm gonna give a couple definitions now, but if at any point I'm sort of just speaking in queer verbiage and you're like, I have no idea what she's talking about, please ask a question and I can clarify. So for the purpose of this webinar, I'm gonna use trans as an umbrella term. So I want folks to know that when I'm using the word trans, I'm also including non-binary folks and all the infinite amount of gender identities that there are. I just think for brevity's sake, right, we would be here all day if every time I was listing every single infinite Right, it's, it's infinite. So I'm gonna be using the word trans as an umbrella term. Another term you might hear me say is assigned male at birth or assigned female at birth. Uh, the shorthand for that is AMAB or AFAB. I'm not gonna explain that because that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, lastly, I will use the word uh, or the phrase chosen name. So that that's only gonna come up when I'm talking about someone who has a name that's different from their legal name. A lot of folks, or what is commonly a common term instead would be preferred name. I don't use that because it means that there's, right, by saying preferred, there's a, a preference. And it's not, oh, I, I prefer chocolate ice cream, but you know, I guess I'll settle for vanilla. This, it, their name isn't a preference. So I use the word chosen name and that's just something instead of preferred. All right, any, any questions that are coming in, Margot? I'm assuming not yet. Not yet. Okay, great. I would hope I'm, that's that's good. I haven't really done too much yet. Uh, so this is kind of what we're gonna go over today because we have all different levels. I'm gonna start with sort of a who, what, when, why, and that will hopefully get everyone sort of on the same on the same page. And then I'm briefly gonna go into some history. I don't wanna spend too much time on that because I want folks to walk away with some practical skills. Uh, and I think that's that's way more important. And also there's just so much information out there. I'm briefly gonna go into dysphoria and we'll do a little outline of the basic principles that are needed for all letters. After that, I'll do a little bit of the specifics uh, with tips that I use in my own letter. And then we'll end with resources and questions. Okay, so the who, here we go. So who's writing these letters? You are, right? That's why y'all are here. Um, it's mental health professionals, does have to be a master's degree level. And who's asking us to write these letters? So oftentimes we're, we're being asked by surgeons or physicians, but in reality, it's really for the insurance companies. Um, that's what the letters are really for. And I think that's important for us to keep in mind. Um, I also wanna just again, remind folks that the different insurance companies or different states might have different regulations about what mental health professional is qualified to write letters. So I once had an experience where um, I was writing a letter for a client at, for the DMV for their gender marker change. And it was before I got my C. So I was an LSW and they were trying to say, oh, well, you're not qualified, you know, blah, blah, blah for that. Turns out they were wrong, but that was something that happened. So you always wanna make sure 
if that's something you're checking. The what. So what are we writing about? And there's really most four things that come up um, is, you know, blockers, hormone therapy, surgeries, and what I just mentioned is like gender marker changes. So for the most part, what I'm going to be talking about today is probably more surgeries or hormone therapy, just in my like language and examples. But I can certainly talk more about um, any of them if folks have questions. So for folks who don't know, when I say blockers, I mean puberty suppressants. Hormone therapy, folks might know that as HRT or just HT. There's lots of different surgeries. And then for the gender marker letter, that actually doesn't happen too often. Um, I don't know how many folks have done those, but if it's really only if someone in Illinois like already has an existing driver's license and they haven't changed like their birth certificate yet, um, then they would need a letter to change that. Speaking of birth certificates, just as a side note, um, if anyone hasn't done it for Illinois for their clients, it's super easy. It's a one page form. You literally just check a box and sign your name and put an address in, which is awesome. So that's something I can certainly share if folks don't know about that. Okay. So when, when are we writing these letters? It's best to have a letter date that's as close to the clients, I'll use the term procedure, surgery, starting of hormones. I might say procedure often, that's just kind of part of the language. Um, what happens sometimes is you'll get a client who they're really excited to move forward and they're like, okay, I need to get a letter and I need to do all these things, but they maybe don't even have a surgeon yet. So I always say like, let's wait because we're just gonna have to sort of rewrite that or update it, or you could start it, but then you're gonna wanna do sort of a revised final version within the year of that procedure because the insurance companies are just going to come back and say, you know, we need an updated one. It's been too long. Another Sorry, thing. Just to one question. Oh, Sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but no, several great. people are asking if we'll share these afterwards. So just, I'm sorry, I didn't mention that on the front end. So sorry to interrupt now, but yes, everyone can have the slides oh. when we're done, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yes. I, I think I sent them already. I think they'll be in the They'll be in the course. So when people go back to where they registered, uh, they'll be able to see them there. Great. Awesome. Any other questions outside of that, Margo? Nope, that was it. Awesome. Um, so letter writing is going to typically take one to two sessions. Uh, for me, um, because I've been doing it pretty regularly, I, I can get them done in one. And the only exception to that would be doing it for children. So to I don't know how many folks on here write for young folks or adults. There is some differences in that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So when I do write for a kid, you have to have uh, information or sort of an interview part with, a gar with the guardians. So that's going to take, you know, another session where you maybe meet with the parents. Um, but other than that, we're still sort of in that, you know, one to two session range. So why? why? Why are we writing letters outside of wanting to just support our clients' goals? The biggest reason I wanted to do this training is I often get clients that come to me just for a letter, and then I find out they already have an individual therapist. And that therapist maybe doesn't feel equipped to write a letter, right, because they don't feel like they're an expert. So they refer that client to, right, said expert, which they sort of see as myself. Um, and I think in that referral, the therapist means well, right? They feel like they're not equipped for that, they refer out. But what this can do is kind of cause a barrier for that client who now has to seek out another provider. Um, they have to talk with a new person and share really vulnerable stuff about themselves. And that's difficult. So the best case scenario is that those therapists seek consultation or attend a training like y'all are doing. So yay for y'all. Um, and because you have the best relationship with your client and that's the most important in letter writing, right? It's great even for insurance companies to see, okay, this, this person has been seeing this, this mental health professional for right this amount of time or this many months or years, that looks better. Okay, and Margo, any questions there? Nope. Oh, hang on. Wait. Uh, G-A-L-A-P question mark. 
Oh, Gallup? Yeah. Yes, we are, we'll talk about that at the end. I don't have, um, I, I talk about that in the resources a little bit. I, that's like a whole thing we could go into, um, but I will definitely mention that at the end. We'll talk about Gallup. Great, thank you. Awesome, okay. So I'm gonna go into a very brief history. Um, right? The history of trans people goes back to the beginning of time, but we really don't have time for that. So I'm gonna start kind of in the 1900s and I'll kind of, you'll see as I'm going through why this sort of is relevant to letter writing. So before I kind of go into it, I will say it's, it's difficult to find super easily accessible information on the history of trans, you know, healthcare and medicine, and a lot of what is out there in terms of treatment or uh, research is mostly done by cis white men, and a lot of the research is also done on um, white folks and um, folks that are assigned male at birth. So we, there's not a ton out there. If, if folks know of like our history resource or a book or something that gives more, definitely share. Uh, this is, again, with that lens on. Um, also, in this slide, you'll see the word transsexual, although that's not a term that's used a ton today, and some folks can find it offensive. The term transgender was really not popularized until the 90s, so that's why that's in here. Okay, so I'm going to start. We have Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld in Berlin, and he was kind of one of the first ones to go shifting the perspective from like curing a trans person and trying to make them basically not trans to providing people with treatment like hormones and surgery to help them live with the gender that they felt most aligned with. So his most famous sort of person that he performed on was Lily Elb, uh, folks who have seen the Danish girl movie, that is who that's based on. Unfortunately, a lot of research from the time was destroyed during the Nazi regime. So a lot of records and stuff are, are no longer available. So then I'm gonna jump to the 40s. We have Kinsey known um, in, out of Indiana. So the Institute for Sex Research, which is now known as the Kinsey Institute. I don't know how many folks are familiar with the Kinsey scale. I'm assuming some folks have heard of that. That still exists. Then in the 50s, um, we have our American Christine Jorgensen World War II veteran who had to travel all the way to Denmark for surgery because there wasn't quality health care in the U.S. And what happened was her story hit the New York Times and it kind of blew up, right? It became this big thing. And a lot of trans Americans were writing to Dr. Hamburger and saying, you know, well, I want treatment too. So what he did as he referred them to Henry Benjamin. And Henry Benjamin was also, he also studied with Hirschfield, or he studied with him at the Hirschfield's, um, Magnus Hirschfield Institute in Berlin. And he wrote the book called The Transsexual Phenomenon, which kind of continued the idea of medical medical treatment versus you know trying to make them not trans and how we can help these people definitely not uh perfect in any way there's a lot of stereotypes in there that are perpetuated a lot of ideas of trans people are just you know, sort of born into the wrong bodies a lot of that kind of stuff but at that time it was kind of known as sort of like the the trans bible then a little bit later on, we have uh, this John Hopkins study that comes out and sort of says, well, patients, there's no better outcome. Patients who have sort of surgeries or hormones are not any better off than the patients who don't. And what happened was this basically led eventually to the closure of the John Hopkins Identity Clinic, and they stopped doing surgeries there. Um, of course, later on, this, the study was cited with a ton of flaws and found to be not actually accurate. but out of that closure and, and that study came um, ben Dr. Benjamin again and came out with the International Gender Dysphoria Associ Association. Um, I don't know, if, does anyone know the name of what that organization is today? Do we have any folks that can take a guess for that? 
feel free to pop it in the Q&A if you no, think no that's all. I'll give like a few more seconds. We got anything, Margo? Nope. Oh, I can see the Q&A. Okay, so it's a W path. Um, and that's the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. Oh, somebody did guess, yay. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, so it was not, a, totally feel okay if you don't, if you got it, you know, gold star for you. So the W path is there to provide clinical guidance for health professionals like us to assist trans people with their overall health. Uh, and this is what we use and, and what the insurance companies see as, um, you know, a guideline that is important for us to follow. And that guideline, um, right, it's based on science and research. Research Again, most of the research is going to be coming from North America, Western Europe. Um, they do, in, in the WPATH and the standards of care, they do have suggestions for ways of thinking about, like, cultural re relativity and competency, but they, they do acknowledge they need some adaptations for other parts of the world that they don't have. So this ties into the DSM, lovely DSM. I'm gonna just give a little bit of sarcasm there. So <laughs> the third DSM was coming out in the eighties and they, that was the first time they added gender identity disorder. Um, and this was shortly after homosexuality was removed, right? In, in, the, in only 1974, which always blows my mind still. Um, but there's sort of this pattern of the DSM, right, pathologizing it or putting homosexuality, gender identity as a disorder in itself, right? There's something perverse about that identity. And then they say, okay, well, actually, right, what we mean is that it's not the identity, it's the distress of the identity. And then it, right, it gets removed completely. And I don't know if that's what's coming for gender dysphoria down the line, right? Started as gender identity dis disorder. Now it is gender dysphoria. Um, that was starting in 2013 in the, that fifth current version. So to be determined if that's something that stays or, or goes away altogether, like the same thing happened with homosexuality. Um, any, any, do we have any questions just about history stuff, Margo? No questions about history stuff, but okay. before we get too far, yes. um, Jess is asking if we know that the client has an individual therapist prior to an evaluation mm -hmm. for a letter, I assume, would it be preferred for the therapist to connect with that provider and encourage them to consult with us versus the therapist accepting the evaluation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it really depends on what's going to be quickest for the client. If it's right, if the ther if you contact the therapist and they're really feeling like, yeah, I'm open to that. I just wasn't sure. Um, and they're willing to work on it or, or do that consult. Um, then I think that's great. If the therapist really feels like this is going to take a lot of time um, and they're really maybe not feeling super comfortable, it might be better to just write the letter for the client and then maybe follow up with some, with that therapist with like, you know, for the future, here's some trainings, here's some information, uh, but basically wanting to just find out what the client wants and, and what's going to be least, like the least amount of barriers for that person. I hope that answers that question. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so why is this all, why am I talking about all of this? Why is this relevant to letter writing? Because, right, we have to use the DSM in our letters for insurance company. So I'm not, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. As y'all can tell, I'm not like the biggest DSM fan. So I just think it's important to highlight because of this requirement. And this is something I'll explain to the client. So I'll talk about, you know, your insurance company is saying as, you know, or sort of a requirement for this letter for the surgery that you have to have this diagnosis. And, and we'll kind of talk about that. So knowing that this, you know, sort of American so Psychological Association or DSM, there's this history of pathologizing and categorizing queer people as sort of sexual deviants, there is that minimal trust. So what I talk about is that 
we're using the diagnosis to ensure that clients get that necessary treatment. So just something to note with, this is the, I just copied and pasted, this is the criteria from the DSM-5 um, for adolescents and adults. So it's the marked incongruence between one's experienced and expressed gender and their assigned gender, and they have to have that lasting at least six months and manifested by two of the following. In order to uh, meet criteria for the diagnosis, the condition also has to be associated with clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or important areas of functioning. So, right, that's a little bit vague. I do wanna say not, not all trans folks experience the same dysphoria or even fit the criteria for dysphoria or feel dysphoria. Um, but if they're in need of a letter, I have really mostly found out that the folks who are looking for like surgery or hormones, um, they're, they're able to fit into the criteria uh, in some way. I, I don't know that I've ever encountered somebody who doesn't necessarily fit the criteria for gender dysphoria and is looking for um, a medical intervention. Okay. The next slide is the same exact thing, um, except for youth. There are differences in the diagnosis. You can see that in the DSM. Um, it's a little bit more focused on gender sort of stereotypes, in my opinion. Um, there's the same marked incongruence, and they need to, again, have it lasting six months or longer, but they need at least six of the following, and one of which has to be the first one. Any questions about DSM stuff? Not so far. Let me double check. Right. Oh, wait, hang on. Okay. It's going to be like, yes, let's move on from that. I know, right? So it, it, anyway, sorry about that. Um, so someone says letters are based on the procedure and what the insurance requires. Two letters are needed by two different providers. And Manisha had a question. I think you're going to address how many letters are needed and why more than one letter is needed. Is that right? Yeah, so a lot of times insurance companies for um, more often for surgery, some I really haven't seen that as much for um, hormone therapies, but for young folks, if you're doing it for under 18, and I can talk a little bit more about that if folks aren't sure. That's great. Okay, we have a couple of other quick questions. This oh. is from Patrick. Um, if gender dysphoria were removed completely from DSM, uh, do you think letter writing would go away or do you think insurance would come up with new requirements we'd have to confirm? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I would love for it to just go away and for folks to be able to get this surgery with, or, you know, hormones or whatever they need without having to go through these hoops. Um, I hope that that happens. I don't know if it'll happen in my lifetime. So I don't know. There's, there's definitely a, a you know, a, an awesome movement of, of people um, advocating and, and working towards policies. Um, I, there's definitely been conversations around it not being in the DSM. I don't know that that's going to happen in the next um, version that comes out. Yeah, doesn't I, I haven't heard anything supporting that yeah. so far, unfortunately. Yeah, Lots of wish, not a lot of movement. Mm -hmm. This is from Aaron. We have a couple more questions here. If a, if a gender dysphoria diagnosis is not used, can letters still be written or does insurance need to see specific diagnosis to approve? So for the most part, it, it really depends on the insurance companies and what they're stating ahead of time. So what I always ask, and I'll talk about this in the next slide, is that in, you'll usually, you can get like a, a guideline of what they're asking for and almost every time it will say, you know, diagnosis of gender dysphoria, or if you go onto insurance company's website and they say, you know, what is needed, that's going to be listed there. I, again, I really haven't had, I've had definitely treated trans folks that don't have gender dysphoria. I haven't had folks that are looking for medical interventions that need a letter that haven't fit that criteria. If a client feels like, I want you to write this letter and, but I don't have gender dysphoria and I don't want that to be in the letter, right? That's that, you know, that client can say that and you can totally do that letter. There's definitely um, a potential that it could get denied. 
um, and you know the client would have to think about what what would happen there. But that's not something I've ever seen. I don't know if other people have had um, that experience at all. Okay, great. Well, we have one more DSM question, and then we have some other questions in the queue. But maybe we can slide, okay. and we'll make sure yeah. we get Theo's and Rebecca's questions. Sure. Uh, this is from Kate. At what age does the DSM have you start applying the adult criteria for gender dysphoria? Thinking about adolescence. Yes, it's 12. So I think once they're 12, they go into the adolescent and then under 12 um, is children, I believe. If I'm wrong, somebody correct me, but I'm almost certain that's what it is. Okay, that's it about DSM. Awesome, great. Whew, done with that. Okay. So I'm gonna this, I'm just gonna go over the basics. So this is what you know, it's sort of needed as an outline for the letter. Does it need to be in this order? Um, I personally break up my letter kind of into these five categories. You don't have to do this. It helps me. Uh, some folks might take this and change it. I'm hoping that whatever you get from this training, you take what is helpful for you and what's not, you leave. So again, you're always asking a surgeon, insurance company if they have a guide, because if they have it, you can use that and just follow their, their steps. If you don't have a guide, um, this is something that I will use as a template. And honestly, even if they give me a guide, usually what they're looking for falls into these categories anyways. So to start, you're gonna start always with, you know, identifying information. If the client's uh, legal name is different than their chosen name, I will usually put the legal name sort of at the top somewhere in parentheses. Uh, and then for the rest of the letter, I'm using that client's chosen name. And then again, maybe I'll put it at the bottom one more time when I'm sort of giving that last sort of certification statement. And I'll show that in the next few slides as well. Um, date of birth is needed in there. I'll also usually make a statement about just like the age of the client because the age of majority is 18 and a lot of insurance companies will want some sort of statement that mentions that for clients that are 18 or older. Um, something else that's important is you wanna make sure you're using the medical name for the procedure. So top surgery or bottom surgery is really not specific enough. They write the insurance company wants to know your certifying for this specific thing. So it's masculinizing chest reconstruction. Um, if you don't know the name of it, certainly you can look it up or you can ask your client, like what is actually the name of the procedure? If the client doesn't know, um, you can definitely contact the surgeon, but it, it's pretty easy to find online. Usually, again, top surgery is maybe one of the more common ones, masculinizing chest reconstruction, double mastectomy, something like that. And if folks have specific questions, I can definitely go into maybe some of those names. Um, next portion is sort of a mental health section. So really just putting the dates of the, the therapy session that you have with the client. If it's you know the first time you can write, you're, you're gonna write that date and then put any relevant psych history. And when I say relevant, I mean, we don't need to be putting everything in the letter. So if I have a client that has OCD about hand washing, uh, it really has nothing to do with, you know, the hormones that they want to start. So I'm not going to put it. Um, it's, it's really trying to think about what is important to this. If the client has um, therapy with another therapist or has passed, I'll always focus on, um, you know, did the client find that to be helpful in improving their mental health, that sort of thing. Um, any psych history that might be helpful to sort of showing the necessity. So if let's say a client has a psych history that includes like suicidal ideation or a suicide attempt, and you can connect it to the gender dysphoria, that actually can be sort of a, a positive persuasive essay piece. And I'll talk about that in a little bit because um, you can kind of show what this is so necessary, right? This is how this is impacting this person's life. And this is why this procedure is necessary and, and needed. Um, and then you always want, again, to make a statement, usually if the person meets the criteria for gender dysphoria. Okay. 
next section, um, I'll go a little bit into what I call like a gender development. Um, I'll do a little bit more for this. This section has a little bit more for kiddos, but basically it gives a timeline, right? Uh, it talks about maybe what steps the client has already taken so far. Um, transitional steps, name change, maybe they've already done hormones and they're now they're coming for surgery. You're going to be talking about also how those things have been helpful for the person and how those things have made things better. Um, not everyone's going to fit sort of that common trans narrative. I've definitely worked with a lot of autistic clients who maybe struggle to verbalize like their feelings around identity. So I'll have someone, you know, okay, how did you come to understand us? And she's like, I don't know, I just, just did. And so, right, that doesn't mean that this client shouldn't have this thing that they need. So I think that's something to note is, is not everyone's going to be able to, to verbalize it or say it in the way that sort of falls into this perfect narrative of, oh, I always knew when I was three years old and blah, 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 that, that that's typically not what's seen. Um, it's important to focus on the reduction of the dysphoria. And this is what I'll, I'll talk, I have a whole slide about this next, but sort of this persuasive essay. And I think about, I don't know if folks, when they were, you know, in, in grade school, they had to write, when you learn about persuasive essays and you have to write about school uniforms and why, right, why you think that you should have them or you shouldn't have them. And I sort of get that passion in my letters. And I feel like I'm writing to the insurance companies in this, like, this is why you have to do this. And you, you, Right, I sort of, I, I have that fire that's lit under me that I, I'm, I'm advocating for my clients. So that's something I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, the next section, so for understandings and support, you want the client, you, it's, it's helpful to have a basic knowledge of the procedure, but right, we're, we're not medical doctors. Uh, we're not there to answer our clients' medical questions. If your client doesn't, seems to not really know that that's something um, you can talk with your client about most places, right? They have a consult clients can go in and ask questions. So that's something you can do clinically is if the client seems like they're really not sure to, to help them understand that. But again, you, we don't have to know that the, the piece of the knowledge of the procedure is making sure the client has an understanding. We're focusing on, does the client know um, recovery is, you know, going to be six weeks long. Uh, maybe the client thinks, oh, well, yeah, you know, the week after surgery, I'm going to, you know, go back to work and I lift boxes in a warehouse. Ooh. Okay. We might want to talk about how that, that might not work for them. Um, that's more a conversation that you can have in terms of helping, helping the client, um, understand what's expected, what's not, doesn't necessarily, that piece doesn't necessarily have to be in the letter, but you want to make sure the client has an understanding of, of the procedure and, and what's going to be happening. Uh, I also like to talk with the client about their support plan. So from like a practical sense of maybe more emotional stuff and then also sort of logistics. So uh, who's taking care of you? Uh, someone going to help you, uh, you know, wash your body. What does that look like? Um, those are things that I will definitely talk to clients about. Also something like if they have time off work, those sorts of things. And then I'll end the letter with some recommendations in that you could share if the client plans to, you know, continue therapy for, you know, support throughout this transition or process that I think can look sort of good to insurance companies that this person's going to continue to have support. And then you will make a statement uh, talking about the necessity of it using, you know, the standards of care through the W path. Any questions about sort of the basic outline? I'm gonna I'm gonna go a lot more into de more into detail in the next couple of slides. Um, well, we have a couple of we have a few questions, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> not necessarily directed to the basics. Do you want them now? Um. Let me do the next slide and we'll see, we'll see where, where we get, if any of those get answered or not. Great. And then we did have from Julie saying that uh, Julie works at an LGBTQ center and that they use a firmed name in their practice. 
So that's mm -hmm. another option for folks to consider. Totally, yeah, I've heard I've heard both of those. Um, something else to note is, is using the, the language that clients use. Um, I once had a client where I think I used, the, I was talking about what happens if you get dead named and the client said, oh, like I don't use dead name because you know that name is the name that my parents gave me at birth and I really, you know, that name means something to me and I don't like the term dead name, right? It's just my, my birth name. So I think it's it's really important to use the language that your client is using. Um, I, I love a firm name. I've heard po people use chosen name more, so that's sometimes what I'll use. Um, I don't know that um, a firm name or chosen name, I think maybe some some folks might feel like one is better than the other. Um, I don't know if anyone has thoughts about that, but yeah, and totally great, great question. Right. Not everybody might know about dead naming. Ah. Um, sure. So uh, did we get some questions about that? No, I'm just anticipating. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so for folks who don't know, dead name would just be um, someone who has um, their legal name is not a name that they like, and that continues to be used by others. Um, some folks will say, oh, you're, they dead named me, or they're using my dead name. Um, some people use that term, and that feels good for them. And I, I usually hear that most of the time but it's, it was important and eye-opening for me to hear from a client that that wasn't a term that they used. So I try, I try to always match the language that my client uses. Okay. I am gonna go into sort of a tips and tricks. Let me just see where we're at timing wise. Okay. So before I really get into letter writing, when I'm first meeting with a client, I'm, I'm gonna acknowledge that power differential. And even though I'm gonna also state that I'm not gonna be a barrier to service, um, which I think helps them, this is something I'm gonna talk about. So I might share that I know it's maybe difficult to talk about their body, that that's gonna be vulnerable. I'll make some statements about um, you know, the movement that hopefully these letters won't be needed in the future. But for now, we're going to kind of write, I'm going to work with that client to make it as quick and easy as possible for them. Um, and if they want to talk about sort of that, my position of power, and if that's something they, they want to explore more, we can definitely do that. And then we sort of will go again into understanding that I'm not going to be a gatekeeper. I'm not going to be a person that's going to stop them from accessing care. I'm not there to determine if they're trans enough. I'm going to write them this letter. Um, this is kind of what I just said. So using client's language, um, I'm never going to make assumptions about a client, right? I can have a person named Brian comes in with a beard, uses he, him pronouns, right? Very masculine presenting, um, wanting top surgery. I'm not going to put trans male on his letter unless that's what he asks, right? So I'm going to ask the client, what gender identity do you want me to put in the letter? Uh, because most letters, they're going to ask what, what the gender identity is. They usually also are going to ask what the assigned sex at birth is. And then same thing for pronouns, asking the client. Um, I'll also just explain the timeline ahead of time. Uh, I have unfortunately had clients who have had some really negative experiences or have had come in with the idea that they think they're going to need to be seen for six months or that they had they saw another therapist and that therapist said they were gonna have to do you know this many sessions so i always let them know we're, you know we're going to get this done as quickly as possible you know hopefully we can either get it done that day or more i will actually type during the session and I'll ask if that's okay with the client. Uh, I do that for two reasons. One, make sure the letter gets done really quickly uh, and is, is easier for me, right? My time, the quicker I can write a letter, the, the more letters I can write for folks. And then I also think it's helpful because I really can capture the client's language. And I think that's really important. Um, so not quotes, but being able to really say, what is the client's perspective? So using, right, use the guidelines that you're provided with. If there's a template that a surgeon or the insurance company gives you, use that. Um, I know that those are usually pretty, 
right? They're pretty bare bones. So if they're not asking for certain information, you don't need to put it. I will say in general, uh, for folks who work with kiddos, um, so like Lurie Children's, they, they'll ask for more details and they'll have things like sexual orientation. So even though I might not think that's super relevant to hormone therapies, um, I, I'm gonna make sure I put that because that's what it's saying. I'll let the client know that and I'll actually print out the guidelines, right? So Lurie Children's, they have a whole thing and they say, right, this is what needs to be in a letter. I'll print that out and I'll, I'll, we'll go through it together and I'll say, okay, they're asking for this and this and this. And that way the client knows and can follow along with kind of what's going on. Um, this is a statement I use at the header um, and I use it for, for all of my letters. And this happened after I saw some requirement that, that wanted some sort of statement at the top like this. And I sort of just adapted it to all my letters. So I'll say the following is a clinical assessment of readiness for, I'll put the client's name. And then if their name is legally different, I'll put it in the parentheses. And then for the purpose of, and I'll state whatever that specific surgery procedure is. Okay. Um, another question I'm always asking myself, which I also ask myself when I'm writing um, therapy notes, is, is this helpful? Right? Is this something that's going to help the client be approved or denied? Uh, is this a statement that is going to be a factor in that? Um, if it is, I'll put it in. If it's not, I'll leave it out. Um, in terms of templates, so right, I'm sharing some of my pieces, but there's tons of templates online. Um, and if you just Google it, there's lots of information, which is great but sometimes it's almost overwhelming. So something to be aware of when you're looking at templates is the dates of them. Um, legislation and language specifically sort of queer stuff changes very fast. So this webinar, right, maybe five years from now is gonna be like, oh, all that stuff is so not true anymore and out of date. So you wanna make sure you're looking at the date, looking at what state or country it comes from. You might find like an awesome letter and you're like, oh, this is great. And you're like, oh wait, it's from Canada, Never mind. So just make sure you're kind of paying attention to that. And you can always combine, you know, for me, I feel like my templates and my, my outlines come from a combination of, of what other people have put out there. I definitely didn't start and just create it on my own. I took what existed and what felt best and what made the letter go as quick and easy as possible for the client. Um, any questions we have, Margo? Yeah, there, we have several questions, but I'm going to take one that is specific to this slide, or you were mm -hmm. talking about um, <clears throat> how long does the therapist and clinician, or the clinician and the client have to have a relationship? It used to be that it was a year, two years. I remember having to, you know, people coming to therapy, simply waiting it out, sort of, you know, right. to get the letter, but- um, Yeah, they had to have like lived in that gender for X amount of time. Yeah, yeah. that's that's not true anymore. Um, you don't have to have, uh, a long relationship with the client. I don't, I've never gotten a denial for that reason. Um, and really they, they're not supposed to. I do feel like there's probably a better chance that it wouldn't if you're somebody that has a longer relationship, but that might just be my own sort of feelings about it and not really based on any evidence. So um, yeah, you can write a letter one time with a client and I'll put that right. That's in my notes. I've met with this client on this date for the purpose of sort of a, a clinical assessment and that that's been enough. Yeah, that makes sense. And then the second part to that question mm -hmm. is they've, uh, also been told that they have to hit a certain weight before qualifying. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. So that is super unfortunate. Um, I know that there are resources out there for giving um, providers and, and surgeons that talk about the bias of that and how that's like not actually true. I haven't had a ton of folks get much success with that uh, just because it seems to be an uphill battle. Um, there are definitely some, I know Gallup, and this is, again, I'll talk about it in the last slide in their harm reduction guide, and they talk about um, giving supports to clients. 
uh, that that's something that's listed in there is like if a client um, is told that they have to have a certain weight for surgery. Um, this is something that happens with lots of surgeries that they will discriminate based on weight uh, and say that it's, you know, of higher risk or something like that, even though that's not necessarily the case. So short end of that is, yes, there's some resources that you can sort of give to the client to help advocate um, and even put some of that language in your letter. I don't know that that will be enough, but that's definitely something that can be tried. Great. Okay. Um, one other question that I think is related to the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from Sarah. Can you explain more the concept of readiness? Does the doctor determine uh, medical readiness and we therapists, are we determining psychological readiness? Yeah, kind of. I, the readiness is not like my favorite term, but I think it's a lot of the terms that the, again, pro like providers will use is like this readiness assessment. Are you ready? Eh, again, not my favorite. Um, yeah. So the idea is that we are determining sort of the mental health that this client is mentally well and stable and right, ready for the surgery. And the doctor does have to do that physical piece. So before surgery, um, usually within, if a client is going through surgery, they'll have, or for hormones, they'll have like a physical appointment, um, making sure that they don't have, you know, any issues or things that are going to interfere medications, anything medical that's going to be a problem in their surgery. So that that's definitely on their end to determine and not ours. We don't need to write about any of those physical things. I hope that answered that. Great. Okay. So going into sort of that persuasive essay part, um, where I kind of share this is sort of my my favorite favorite. It's weird to have a favorite part of the letter, but this is where I'm going to be talking about why this treatment is medically necessary and that it's going to be detrimental to the client's well-being. So you can kind of break that up into different areas of issue. So if I'm talking about a client that has top surgery, I might say, okay, well, what do you do to reduce maybe your chest dysphoria now? And if they say they wear a binder, okay, we talk about like, well, what happens when you wear a binder? Okay. I get chest pain or like I've worn my binder so long that I know I'm not supposed to, but right, the dysphoria is worse than, you know, any other physical pain. They might have cracked ribs, um, right? The, their skin might be irritated from, from wearing it super long. Um, things like because of how I'm perceived or gendered based on my appearance, um, right? Maybe folks before hormones, they'll avoid using the bathroom. Um, I've had a lot of young students who do that. And so they won't drink any water during the day, right? So they're dehydrated. They might have, you know, urinary issues because they're withholding going to the bathroom. So these are things that are really great sort of persuasive tools of like, okay, well, this is, these are problems. These are going to be medical problems. Insurance companies, you're not going to want to pay for these medical problems. You better get this done. So other uh, mental health issues that could come along, maybe they're because of um, dysphoria around their chest, maybe they have difficulty showering, that, that leads to you know, depression and isolation. Uh, maybe they don't wanna go into public or they don't feel comfortable going to camp because there's gonna be swimming there and they don't wanna be in a swimsuit. So we can kind of talk about the difficult stuff. Um, now, this isn't easy for clients to talk about, I have found that when I frame it in a, you know, we're going to kind of use this as a persuasive essay and we're going to really, you know, kind of stick it to them. There's, there's a little bit more fun with it in the way we even use language. So I found that to kind of be helpful with clients. Um, and then we kind of talk about the other side. So the other part of it is what is, what is it going to be like after this, right? After hormones or after surgery, um, what are the things that are going to improve for you? So, okay, yeah, like if I don't have to wear a binder, now I can exercise, right? That's going to improve my mental health. Um, I'm not going to have, right, if I get my uterus removed, I'm not going to have menstrual cramps anymore. And, and that's uh, really going to help with my dysphoria. And I won't have to um, miss, maybe they're missing school. So talking about, you know, mental health improvements, 
I'm going to feel more confident. Now I'm, my anxiety is lower because I'm right now that I have a beard, I'm not going to be afraid of being misgendered anymore. You know, social activities, those kinds of things. So, and I, I've even talked about like increased school performance. So students that are super distressed and maybe are missing school, um, you know, feel suicidal, that kind of stuff. I'm going to talk about why doing this, whether it's hormones, blockers, surgery, whatever it is, why this thing is medically necessary. Any questions about that part? Um, not specific to that. Okay, awesome. Mar where are we on time? So it is 1028. We We have about 17 minutes of presentation time left. Okay, perfect. That should probably be just perfect. Uh, this slide and then we'll go into um, some resources. So this is a sentence I use again in all of my letters. I've taken it from other places uh, and sort of combined it. So I'll, I'll put the client's name and I'll say they've been persistent and consistent in, I copied this from a letter of someone who was using she, her pronouns. Um, consistent in her identity as, put that gender identity. Um, they've met all the eligibility and readiness criteria outlines in the, in the official standards of care for the treatment of transgender individuals. There's no evidence of psychopathology or impaired judgment given the preceding report and as a clinician that has an expertise and specialization in working with transgender individuals, I certify blank person to be a fit candidate for that thing. Um, the reason I added that sort of expertise specialization sentence only came from one letter where they, the insurance company wanted to have some sort of statement that you are, that you have experience with this or that you have a knowledge of this. So I added that sentence and I just kind of kept it for the rest of the time. So that sentence for me kind of just sums up all of the pieces it, it gives the WPATH stuff, it says this person, you know, doesn't have impaired judgment and I'm this mental health professional that's certifying this procedure. Uh, I also wanna, during the process, something we, we talked about with that question is like offer resources. So you're talking with the client and you're going through asking them about supports and they say, yeah, I don't really, you know, I don't really know any other trans people. And you ask like, is that something you'd like? They say, yes, maybe, maybe they, don't exactly know where to go, definitely awesome to share resources in that space if that's something they're looking for. And I will give some resources in our next slide. So the last sentence that I end with is sort of a, a contact question. And the, again, the reason I added this was um, that is also a requirement of some letters, right? That you have to give a statement that you can be contacted with further questions actually never been contacted with further questions, uh, but I always add that. You also wanna make sure you have um, a release of information signed as well so that they do contact you, you can actually give information. So I always ask how the client wants to be involved in reviewing the letter. Some folks will write, I'll, I'll kind of type up a draft and I'll send it to them and I'll say, what do you think? Are there things you wanna change? Are there parts of the language you don't like or isn't quite right for you? And we'll do that. Uh, and that might just be you know, through an email or if they wanna have another session where we go through it. Sometimes, especially with my adolescents, they're like, yeah, it's fine, you got it. And they just, they just have me send it and they don't, they don't really wanna see it or don't care to, um, which is fine. So I'll, but I always am asking, you know, what, is the, what does the client want and how they, how they wanna be involved? Um, lastly, your letter shouldn't be super long, definitely one to two pages, maybe exception onto three for, again, kids, because you have the element of the parent session. Um, they usually want with the kiddos, if it's um, certain things like blockers, a lot of times they'll want information about uh, fertility preservation and those sorts of things. So those might be a little bit longer. But if you're right, writing a letter and it's five pages, it's too long. Uh, you need to cut it down. We don't need to give insurance um, or the surgeons all of that information. They don't need it. Um, they shouldn't have all of it. It's probably um, too much. So that's just something to kind of give you a guideline of 
how much to write. Okay. We have one question. Sure. Uh, from Andrew, is that statement, uh, we have other questions and we will get mm -hmm. to them folks, but about this, this particular slide, is that statement all you put in the WPATH section? I, yes, um, I, there is a little bit more um, when I'm writing in terms of like standards of care, I'll talk a little bit about it, but honestly, as long as you have that one statement, that's really all they're looking for is some sort of thing that you are going along the guidelines. They don't really make you describe how you're doing that. So that honestly is fine. Um, I think it kind of depends on what else is in your letter, but for the most part, I mean, there are letters where that literally is the only part that I've done around the W path and that has not been a problem. I don't know if anyone else has a different experience. I certainly would not want folks to all go and do that and then feel like, oh no, I got a ton of you know denials or something. Okay. Um, so for resources, I know in our first slide, um, somebody mentioned Gallup, which is awesome. So that's the gender affirming letter access project. And, and really what that is, is a joining a list of providers that are agreeing to write pro bono letters um, as a part of resisting the harmful practices of gatekeeping, the, the financial burden that trans people have to face to get access to care, right? If, if I need a surgery for something else, I don't have to go to a mental health professional and pay to see them for them to tell me that I'm, you know, mentally stable enough to get the surgery. So uh, it's really, it's really an important movement. Um, I signed the pledge. You can do, you know, they kind of have like minimum one letter a month pro bono. I would suggest reading the FAQs on that website. It's really, I think the way that they put that out there is just super helpful to kind of explain the importance of it. And they also have a harm reduction guide on there that I talked about that just gives like more sort of to do's and not to do's when writing letters, which um, I think is awesome. Once you're part of the pledge, that's actually how clients can find you. So they can go to the Gallup sort of registry and see providers that are in the area um, and they can select you to do that. The next resource is uh, my own website, uh, thelistforus.com. Um, Juniper hosts that, and it is uh, something I hope that everybody shares. It is, I, I have a lot of very tech savvy interns that have helped create that. It's basically a one stop shop uh, for, for Chicagoland uh, resources that are specific for trans folks and the people who love them. We're always adding more resources. We're on social media. So if you have Instagram, definitely check us out. Uh, it's something that has been a long time in the making. And I'm really glad it's been about a year now that we've had that site live. So please, please, please check it out, share with folks. Uh, and the last resource um, is the Transgender Training Institute. They, right, this should not certainly be your only training that you do around this topic. They have lots of really awesome ones really regularly, and they're all from trans people or non-binary non folks, so you can support and pay them for doing the work um, and educating everyone. They have workshops about different things, so some of it is more clinical based. They also have stuff around educator, like education. So if someone in your life is a teacher, they'll have things like, you know, how to make your classroom um, affirming, things like that. So though, and again, this is not an exhaustive list of resources, but I kind of wanted to highlight a few that um, I have used very regularly. Ari, are there lists of gender affirming surgeons? Uh, Manisha was talking about, Manisha, this is, this is a thing right now that uh, Manisha has a client that's been waiting for a very long time to get surgery scheduled. I'm assuming this is typical, but wishing they had more options. And do we have a robust <laughs> list of surgeons? So um, a couple things. Yes, um, surgeons are having super long wait lists, especially the ones that are more well-known in Chicagoland. On the list, which is, and I can give a little bit more detail, the list for us was basically, I used to keep a personal spreadsheet of you know, who are the affirming therapists and what are the groups that are going on and who are the surgeons? And I would just keep the spreadsheet. And I was like, man, this would be great if this was a website. And I was like, ah, oh, someday, I'll, you know, sort of a dream. 
And it came to be, I got, again, all these interns, um, non-clinical interns mm -hmm. that have been helping me from Adler University, created this website. I believe one of them is on the webinar right now. Hi, Patrick. Um, and so that has a medical tab and there are surgeons that are listed on there. There's also a site that has been down. I'm not sure what's going on with it. It's called Rad Remedy. It's basically a database for a finding affirming providers. And, it, and it's all across the, the nation. Um, so that would be another place to go on. Outside of those two spaces, um, the, that would be like where I would look, would be Red Remedy. Again, not sure if that's working right now still. And then the list has a bunch of, a bunch of uh, resources on there and might even have links to websites that have other lists. We have um, from Laura is in North Carolina and says that they also work for an LGBT center of Raleigh um, and that they keep a list of providers that do not require a BMI or other gatekeeping. So people who are in the North Carolina area, sounds like Laura could be a good resource for this Absolutely. kind of information too. Great, thanks, Laura. Yeah, and I think that um, sometimes is more surgeon um, bias than it is the insurance companies because the insurance companies in the letter, they're not necessarily asking for those things. Um, so, but yeah, I haven't, I don't know of a ton of um, those specific resources or list of surgeons in this area, but if anyone knows that um, for Chicagoland, please, please, please share that. Great. And then we have from Jess, another good resource for our clients is a top surgery group on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it, it looks like it's called top surgery removal backslash reduction. They can read people's firsthand experiences, search by locations, see photos, et cetera. That's great. Definitely. Um, yeah. A lot of my young folks will use uh, YouTube a ton. They follow YouTubers that, um, go through different things, um, different transitional steps, whether it's hormones or depending if they want to use gel or injections and they'll have different people who kind of track their experiences. So that's super helpful for clients. Other questions? Yep, they're more general and we can get to those in the Q&A. Great, thanks. So like I can read them in the Q&A? No, when, when we get oh. to the Q&A portion. Oh yeah, well, we're there. This was, that oh, was the, the last slide. Well done. Was, okay, this, great. Uh, yeah, I think timing wise, right? We're, we're at the end well here. Well done. You're doing great. Um, <laughs> Pat was asking if Laura can uh, share the North Carolina resource. Uh, they have a lot of contacts there. And so Laura, if you can take a look in the chat or everyone, Laura saw it, great. Or, sure, yeah, sure. great, wonderful, saw it. Okay, so other questions. This is great, folks. Thanks for participating in this way. And Ari, such good information. Um, so this is from Theo. Do you encourage clinicians to provide referrals that don't require letters? Example, informed consent for HRT. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll explain a little bit for folks who don't know what informed consent means. So for hormone therapies, if you are over the age of 18, there's an informed consent model, which means there's places that you can go to to access those things where you don't need a letter. Uh, some folks don't know about that. So if I'm seeing someone and they come in and they're over the age of 18, they're looking for a letter and they're wanting to start hormones, I definitely will say, hey, if you, if you don't want to go through this process, uh, there's places like Planned Parenthood or Howard Brown in the city where you can just go in. Um, sometimes you don't even need an appointment and you'll be able to get hormones. And they're like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. That's awesome. And, you know, I'll be like, great. And, you know, I give them some resources and that's sort of the end of it. And we don't need to do a letter. Uh, but some folks maybe want to choose a specific clinic that does use, that doesn't have the informed consent model. Uh, they maybe feel like there's a little bit more um, like a wraparound services or care that is, um, outside of sort of like a community funded center. So I'll definitely let them know that, absolutely. There is, oh, and just, there is no informed consent model for anyone that's under 18, so that doesn't work for youth. Um, and then obviously for surgeries, uh, I, that is not something I've seen. Great, okay, this is from Jess. Um, 
Two questions. One is, is it ever appropriate to not recommend someone for the procedure? That's a great question, Jess. Or recommend continued therapy in conjunction with the procedure, i.e. severe mental health concerns? Great question. Um, and definitely something I get a lot. So I come from the perspective of it. It's really even if somebody has some pretty significant mental health issues or you're maybe personally feeling like you're not really sure, I don't feel like it's my decision to make, right? It's not my body. And that's something I always go back to. So, right, if someone wants to make a decision about getting a face tattoo, right? And I'm not saying this is the same thing, right? I could say like, well, maybe not a good idea. Like, I don't know if I would do that. Like, it's not my body. and there is a potential that that person regrets that decision later down the line. Um, the thing that I feel like is most important is letting that person have the autonomy to make that decision. Um, I'm not gonna be the person that's gonna stop them from, from making that choice if they're an adult. So if there is someone who has really significant mental health concerns and you're worried about, um, sort of safety or other issues. I haven't necessarily had that happen, but I would definitely love to maybe have somebody who has encountered that talk a little bit more about what that experience has been like if they've ever had someone that they felt um, is really not stable in any way. I've had folks who have maybe had um, like bipolar two and have maybe had some manic episodes or paranoia but it really has not been related to their gender dysphoria. And they definitely came in to see me at a time when they were stable. So for the most part, that's not something I'm seeing too often. Okay. I don't know well, if that was, that was sort of a way around that question, but if, I don't know if that answered it. Uh, well, if anyone has any other experience to share, please feel free. But uh, the second part of this question from Jess is, what would you say to providers who are apprehensive to write letter letters for liability reasons? Um, so another good question. Um, I would definitely take a look at the FAQs on the Gallup Pledge. It's something that talks a lot about and talks through what it means to be apprehensive and that liability piece. I know folks are, are really concerned about what does that mean to be liable? You're also not the only person in this process, right? So a client is, like we talked about for surgery, is likely going to need two letters. Uh, there's also a surgeon that's performing these things. So it, it's you're not the only person in this process, right? There's a lot of steps and a lot of things that that are done to, to get, for this client to get to this place. Uh, so it's, it's not all on you. So that's, that's one thing that I would say. Uh, and then again, I would, I would check out the FAQs on the Gallup page because they're just better at uh, sort of talking about that piece on there. Great, okay. This is from Kat. Uh, would you include, um, wait, would you include support plan info in the letter? Is that something insurance companies care about seeing? Yeah, I typically do. Um, I feel like it's it can be helpful and <clears throat> shows the insurance company there's some sort of um, support in place that is something they want to see usually, uh, and that the client can like follow the the sort of standards of care. So this right, if insurance companies are going to pay for the surgery, they like to see that the client is going to be resting and listening, following doctor's orders, um, that they have a person that is going to be there to support them. So yes, I absolutely include that kind of stuff. Um, I'll add pretty much every piece of a support plan into that last part of the letter. Yeah. Okay, uh, this is from Jasper. For clients that transferred from a previous therapist and also address gender dysphoria with the historical therapist, would it be important to reference the client's previous therapy work in the letter to qualify the length of time spent with a mental health professional? Good question. Yeah, I definitely will add that. Um, I try to add whatever mental health history that is relevant and I would, I would follow that category of like, yeah, that's relevant. So 
they saw a certain therapist for X amount of time uh, and worked on, you know, issues around gender. And you can maybe cite the reason of like, you know, the client switched either it wasn't a good fit or maybe the therapist moved, but I will put that information in the letter. It's a great question. Great. Okay, this is from Wendy. Do surgeons require patients to have established supportive people or caregivers in order to approve moving forward with the procedure? Aside from having had counseling therapy support, someone like a family member or friend, et cetera. Yeah, that's a really good question. I have never seen it listed necessarily as a requirement. Um, I think it's something that they definitely will ask about and want. I don't know that I've ever seen someone where a surgeon is like, well, I'm not going to do the surgery because you don't have support people. Um, I've really never, never seen that or heard of that. I don't know if anybody else has any anecdotal experience with that. All right, we'll see if anyone pops it in the Q&A. Okay, this is from Jessica. If you're writing this letter with the client in a session, can it be a build service or does it need to be a case management charge if in a space where a client has a fee for service? Um, so if you're writing a letter with an established client in a session, uh, it could sort of be part of your Part of a regular session and that's just what you're working on if you're just doing the letter for the first time um, again i would really encourage you to to check out the gallup and take the pledge to do that that work pro bono um, if the client is really wanting to use their insurance and that's something that you're going to go through um, you can use the diagnostic well that first uh, intake code because that's technically what it is, you're sort of doing an intake, you're gathering information. Um, and that's the, you can do the 90871, 90791. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I know we had to think for a second. Okay, yeah. Jasper has another resource for non-binary clients looking for more top surgery diversity. They also recommend the Facebook group, I have no nipples or may not have nipples in the future. Thanks, Jasper. Yeah, and Jasper, definitely go on the list for us.com and you can, um, anyone who has a resource, you can send it to us and we'll get it added if we, if it's not already on there. So so please do that. I don't want to miss anything. Right. Thank you. This is a very generous group. I appreciate that. Um, and then Theo also said uh, they think just having a ride from the hospital afterwards might be required, not, you know ongoing support, but somebody, you know, if you're going to need somebody to help you with direct. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I've seen that. Um, so that might be a little bit more coming from the surgeon part and not so much a requirement in our letter, but that is definitely something to, to talk about. Yeah. Uh, okay. This is from Jennifer. You mentioned that you would not be a gatekeeper. Are there any reasons why someone would not be appropriate for surgery from a mental health standpoint and where you just would not write a letter? Another good question. Yeah. Not that I've encountered, um, right? I say no now, maybe at some point that happens, but I, I really have never never seen that. Um, so I suppose maybe if somebody was having sort of like some sort of psychotic episode and that was only occurring during that time period, that might be a time where Maybe I'm, I would look for some consultation around that, but from the decade that I've been doing this, I've really never seen that. I don't know if, if anyone else has any thoughts about that. Well, we have um, Esty, who is a part of our team, who says I've had experience of letter writing for someone with major mental illness. Um, Esty, are you available to comment? Yes, I'm here. Yay, good morning. Hello. Um, so I have had the experience, I would first say that um, it's often a self-selecting process. Um, you know, by the time somebody gets to the point where they have enough resources to be considering surgery or hormones, it's very unlikely that they're gonna have such low functioning from major mental illness um, that you would have any reservation. So that's the first thing. I think a lot of therapists are just worried about what if somebody comes in and they're really, really ill. And I'm afraid of what, you know, what I would do. I really think that that's highly unlikely. Number one, number two, um, 
you know, when you're thinking about working with anybody who's got, um, you know, major mental illness, or I had a client one time with schizophrenia who asked for a letter, that person was living with schizophrenia and had, and was managed and, you know, had, had housing and had um, all of the things that, you know, anyone who has an illness would need to be able to also access appropriate healthcare. So I think that it's not, it's not something that is, you know, that you have to think of as a rule out at all. Um, it's just, it, it, you, would fall, you would sort of go through the process of checking out their resources and making sure that um, you know, they, they have what they need in order to have, this, have their health care taken care of, just like any other kinds of health issues that somebody would have. So that's kind of how I would weigh in on that. That's great. Thank you, Esty. Thank you so much, Esty. That, that was really well said. Um, I love you just talking about, right, it's, it's not about having a major mental health disorder or whatever, right, that major means or right, higher level um, mental health disorder isn't a mutually exclusive reason to not be someone that should access this resource. Exactly. And I think that sort of folds nicely into this next question. Um, that if the person has a co-occurring mental health disorder that continues to impact them and they're taking psychiatric medications, does this affect their ability to have surgery? And do you mention that in the letter? Um, so yeah, I definitely have had things like that come up where a person maybe is struggling with some other things. I really try and focus on the surgery aspect. Um, if they have another mental health disorder that's going on and they're struggling with that piece, there are times where you might mention that that's something the, the client is working on in another therapy space, uh, but that it's sort of separate from the dysphoria piece or right, that part doesn't necessarily need to be in it. Um, sorry, what was, can we, can we go, can I, can't, the question is gone now, I can't see it. What other parts oh, of the question? Sorry, are well, I think they're just saying, do you just stick with the, do you include that other diagnosis in the letter or do you stick with gender dysphoria when you're talking about the diagnostic piece? Yeah, I, you can put other, um, other parts in there and I have done that before. It doesn't just have to be um, gender dysphoria as long as you are noting that, that other, you know, writing about the treatment of that other diagnosis and that that thing is, you know, stabilized or that they're, they're working through those things. So that would be the important piece if you're going to list something else. Wonderful. Okay. So we just have about four minutes left. So I mean, seeing if there's any common themes in the questions. Um, I think we're discussing a bit from Kate asking about what is the approach if you feel the client doesn't have the social, practical, emotional resources for recovery and coping through the procedure, which I think is kind of the, the surgical piece. Is that something more that the hospital and the surgeon would be dealing with? Yeah, so that's another thing you could give some resources about. I think I heard about this. I don't know. I can't remember the name of it. It's, it's some like Jason's house or something like that for folks who don't have a place to go post surgery recovery and need help. It's um, sort of an organization and they have a, like sort of a, an apartment in the city and you can stay there uh, and they have folks that come and check on you. So those would be some resources that you would want to share with that person. That's great. Right. Cause I mean, they're like any surgery, you know, sometimes. Yeah. You, and there you know. are, and there are a lot of people who don't have that support system. Um, right. So there are definitely resources out there uh, to help those folks. Right. You live on a third floor walk up and you can't carry your groceries. I mean, you know, yeah. there's that sort of thing, right? This is from Jenna. Have you had any issues with insurance improving patients for gender affirming surgery surgeries who identify as non-binary? Uh, I have not. I don't, I, I also, yeah, no, I haven't. Um, I don't know if that's something other people have, have had, but that has not been an issue. I've, done a ton of letters for folks who are non-binary and that has not been a, been an issue. Been an issue. Okay. Well, you know, we just have a couple of minutes. I am so sorry, folks. I know some people still have questions. Uh, we need to cover housekeeping quickly, but also Ari, if people, I'm going to print these out and maybe we can send emails to each of these folks if we sure. have their 
email address. We'll try to get back to you, or you can email Ari at Ariel Groner, A R I E L G R O N E R. I'll put it in the chat at the junipercenter.com. Uh, so that you can get more information or have another question answered. Is that okay? Now that I gave everybody your email. Yes, no, totally. And I think my email is also, um, we also have the list has its own email. If you have specific resources or questions about resources that has its own email as well. That's great. So people can contact you with questions and, and we'll try to get back to folks Absolutely. questions. That's great. Um, so Deanna, will you please hop on one more time? Folks are having to hop off because some people have 11 o'clock clients. So just another bit of housekeeping, please. Absolutely. Uh, so that email for the list is the listforus.contact at gmail.com. For those of you who registered for the CEUs, you can immediately, as soon as the webinar ends, go back into your course, take the test and get your certificate right away. I will also send an email shortly with the link to go right there to take that test and do it. Uh, the, the slides for everyone who's registered, whether it's CE or free, those the, this whole deck is already in your course. So if you go back in right now, you've got that to download with all this fantastic information. And then finally, in about two weeks, if you wanna watch the program again, it will be uploaded to YouTube. Of course, that does you can only get the CEUs through the course that you've registered for, but you can watch that again on YouTube. And we really encourage you to actually um, subscribe to the Juniper Center on YouTube for the professional development webinars, as well as just other mental health tips and interviews and things as well. Uh, and that's what I got for you. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions, you can drop those actually in the chat right now if they're logistical stuff, but I think we're good. Perfect. Well, thank you all for joining us today. So glad to have you. We hope you'll come back again. Deanna, thank you for producing. Ari, thank you so much for putting this all together and, and spending time to teach everyone these things. There's lots of nice thank yous in the chat. So very much appreciated, Ari. Wonderful presentation. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. If you're in the Chicago area, it is cold. If you're elsewhere, I hope it's not so cold. But nice to have everyone with us. We will see you next time. Be well.